This week on Cumulus on Cloud, we're going to talk about platform as a service. Or actually, don't I just mean Kubernetes? There's a lot happening in the platform as a service space. Uh, everybody's sort of taking that early model developed by the likes of Heroku and applying it to their cloud platform. Uh, often leveraging other tools, specifically some of the open cloud platform tools like Cloud Foundry is a service that you can get on many of these clouds, uh, specifically IBM's cloud has a Cloud Foundry solution that you can actually get as a managed service. Uh, and, and you can certainly deploy these open applications onto any of the clouds. But the cloud platforms themselves often have their own version of that application as a service managed uh, set of resources. And there's a, a certain use case where that makes plenty of sense. Uh, just the, the whole idea that a developer wants to focus on their one language, their one control code uh, base, and uh, talk to something else that can handle the data storage of a database or multiple different types of databases, and dealing with the operational scale of your application outside of your own domain. That's really the land of these platform as a service uh, environments. But they are somewhat restrictive in, in that you are locked into that model for managing your application lifecycle. There's nothing wrong with that, especially given that with both the OpenShift model and the Cloud Foundry model, you can deploy those resources and those services onto any cloud you so choose, even onto your own private environments if you, if you want to do it that way. But we're seeing a big shift in that there is a, a sort of a, a unification of the class of systems models that a platform as a service provides, and that unification is happening through Kubernetes. In fact, we're seeing announcements from the Cloud Foundry folks, the OpenShift folks have done this now for quite a while, where they have migrated their backend services into Kubernetes. So many of the systems models that you would use to interact with these environments are starting to look more and more like Kubernetes anyway. So the real question is, do I go and implement a platform as a service today, or instead, do I step back and say, what's the delta with me taking on a portion of the operational complexity of using a tool like Kubernetes? Is there value there? Do I have to deal with things that I don't want to deal with that I'd like to hand off to a platform as a service offering? That's a decision that still has to be made. But I think we're seeing a trend towards supporting Kubernetes as, a, as an environment. Now, one of the reasons that I find it's very effective to use Kubernetes as that model, if possible, if your engineering organization can handle working with the Kubernetes systems model, you can uh, processize the, the deployment models for working with Kubernetes, either manually building your own manifests and pushing them into your Kubernetes environment, or using a tool like Helm or the, the Google-derived scaffold project, um, moving into something like the GitOps space uh, that, that sort of handles that operational model through Git. Um, there are a number of these different approaches to handling these resources. And I think that the one nice thing about the Kubernetes as my backing store without the overhead of Cloud Foundry or the, the front end model of Cloud Foundry, without the front end model of OpenShift, is that if I have Kubernetes as an interface, even if I make these models happen on my own, build my own application to deliver the application into the Kubernetes environment, I can now choose any cloud to deploy that Kubernetes system or that, that Kubernetes-ified system into. And this is the real benefit. Kubernetes gives me one model for all of my applications. Now, there are some slight deltas. There's still the question of how do you actually get ingress into an environment if you don't have the public load balancer engine that the Googles and the Amazons, et cetera, provide for you. Uh, there are ways of, of getting around that. Uh, in fact, most people are deploying using the ingress controller model anyway. So then it's just a matter of saying, well, if I use ingress with something like node port on my own environment or my manually deployed environment, maybe that's adequate. Uh, but we're seeing more and more environments where there is a public or automatable load balancer resource available. If you back all the way back a couple of years back and you deploy open uh, open stack as your infrastructure, which is actually still not at all unusual, there's still plenty of VM-based workloads 
workloads where you want both of these environments. With the OpenStack infrastructure, you can actually deploy Load Balancer as a service in OpenStack and get your own manual Kubernetes environment that has that one integration uh, touch point. The rest of the services all look identical for the most part. Storage through uh, persistent storage is equivalent on all the platforms except for maybe performance or backup resources. Um, the, the networking functions, you can use the, the CNI networking model if you want to do network-based policy. That's available to you. Most people are now layering Istio on top. Istio couldn't care less about the rest of the infrastructure. It is effectively an overlay anyway within the Kubernetes environment. So the question really comes down to, with all those pieces becoming available, does it still make sense to go back and use the platform as a service model for your application development? And I would say that there are still some benefits to platform as a service. If your application team does not have the operational desire to manage even deploying a Cloud Foundry into a public environment, then maybe go to get Cloud Foundry from somebody like IBM's Cloud Foundry as a service uh, model, or have somebody else install Cloud Foundry and operate Cloud Foundry for you even in a public cloud, and then use that platform as a service model to deploy your application and run it at scale. Because the platform as a service model does try to simplify those interactions and simplify the underlying operations of those interactions. So that's where the benefit comes from, from the, the classic past, the OpenShift and the Cloud Foundry based models. Whereas the Kubernetes model means that you build one operations model for your application, and now you can target any cloud that has a Kubernetes interface. Uh, and, and, and we're finding that more and more clouds are providing that, especially the uh, GKE, uh, AKS, EKS. Uh, actually, I can't remember if IBM has shortened theirs to IKS, but probably they should or have. Um, but, but any of these services where the, the operations of the container platform, the Kubernetes platform is actually handled by somebody else, you still have access to that from the perspective of being able to talk to the API and manage your resources through that API. And you have control usually over the, the types of target compute resources that you're deploying to run your workloads on. So if you want to enable uh, uh, GPU-based resources so you can do machine learning or something along those lines through your Kubernetes interface, it's very easy to do that. So again, there's sort of another benefit to the Kubernetes model, and that is that you, you have more control over the underlying resources and how you interact with them because there are good models for doing that today. So I would say overall, you, you really do have a choice to make today. In terms of platform as a service, do you want to go with a Cloud Foundry uh, or, or an OpenShift-like systems model because it simplifies that, that over, overall operational model? It creates some limitations in terms of what you can do because there has to be some form of back-end integration in terms of the database models that are supported and the infrastructure resources models, like can I get access to GPUs and things of that nature. Uh, conversely, going the Kubernetes model means that there is a little bit more operational overhead. Somebody has to at least be aware of how that Kubernetes system is working, um, and, and somebody has to build the deployment model for your application into that Kubernetes environment. But once that's been done, you do have flexibility in targeting potentially multiple clouds. So when you really want to talk about a resilient application, if you did a global DNS load balancing to get to your closest cloud, and that might be an Amazon cloud, but with a backup of uh, an IBM cloud on the East Coast or a, a Alibaba cloud in, in China, suddenly you have the ability to talk to these different resources just driven through DNS. Um, and and yet your application model is still the same. The distribution of your application source is the same. A number of these resources sort of tie themselves and couple some, themselves more closely together, and and make your life a little bit easier to to implement from uh, from a, a, a longer term operational uh, perspective. So I, I think there's a lot going on in the space. Uh, like I said, we're now seeing more and more of those platform as a service resources actually riding on top of Kubernetes. Uh, and, and we're seeing that like the, the Cloud Foundry guys just recently announced the fact that they are now using or have models for deploying Cloud Foundry onto Kubernetes. Not just Cloud Foundry being able to talk to Kubernetes, that's been around for a little while, but Cloud Foundry really running itself inside of a Kubernetes environment and then using that Kubernetes environment to run its applications, its, its, its services for you and the services that you deploy into it. So we're seeing a lot of change. I would say keep, you know, you know stay tuned to this space uh, for more information as, as we see that continue to develop. Um, but uh, there's really a lot of flexibility and a lot of interest going into this space. And I still think that uh, if you have a choice today, 
Kubernetes is the direction to go. In fact, I, I believe so strongly about it that I do not have any classes on platform as a service other than Kubernetes focused classes, both on our Udemy channel and in our uh, Cumulus, uh, Cumulus Learning channel as well. We really look forward to having you join us in our next episode. And uh, certainly if, uh, if you wanna learn more about this, uh, follow us here. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell so you get notified. Uh, we're planning on doing some, some live episodes here in the near future where we actually maybe start using some of these tools. Uh, so do stay tuned for that. And if you need uh, education or consulting support, please come to us. We really look forward to having you. Well, folks, thanks for watching. If you liked it, don't forget to like it. Uh, hit that thumbs up button. We always like to know that we're doing a good job. Uh, don't forget to share this with your friends. And uh, just to make sure that you get the latest and greatest episodes that we release, hit that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit the little bell next to it so that you actually can get notified when they come out. Thanks so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.